Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to the uh, noon round. Uh, pickings are kind of slim today. I think it's probably the snow. I don't think it's anything uh, about our speaker. Uh, but I think there's a prize at the door for everyone who showed up today. Um, well, today's the uh, Shiskull Lectureship. And uh, one of the fun things about these lectureships is you get to celebrate someone who practiced in the community or was part of your institution. Um, and it's a celebration of their contribution and their time. And uh, Dick Shiskull was a surgeon up in the Montgomery County area who did his big cases down at Children's. I never had the pleasure of meeting him, but I've heard a lot about him. And unfortunately, his wife uh, and uh, her husband couldn't be here today. Um, but uh, we obviously thank the family for their contribution to allow this to happen. For an academic institution, it's a great time to invite a colleague, someone who uh, works in a different center. We have a great dinner. We, we talk uh, medicine all morning. And, and it's a, a real treat uh, for a, a center to do this. Uh, and today is no different. Uh, our guest lecturer uh, is Dan Saltzman. Dan is the chief of surgery at the University of Minnesota. Um, so I, I think he may have had something to do with bringing the bad weather here. Um, he, he did ask me when we were driving in. I was just telling Dr. Newman. He, he said, are you, by the way, in, in all-wheel drive? Uh, so it looked like I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> we got here safely, uh, as did all of you. Um, Dan, uh, interesting enough, uh, grew up in Panama City. Uh, he's Panamanian. Um, and uh, he, he spent his formative years there, but his uh, high education was all in the U.S., and it was all at the University of Minnesota. He did his B.S. degree, his M.D. degree, his Ph. degree, all at the University of Minnesota. And then he did pediatric surgery in Arkansas. Or is it Arkansas? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and then, of course, if you have a good uh, uh, resident, a good surgical resident, or a great surgical resident, you recruit them back. And then he went back to University of Minnesota. He's a pediatric surgeon there and the chief of pediatric surgery at the Children's Hospital. Uh, it's a real pleasure, Dan. Uh, uh, I met Dan properly when we were both doing board examinations, not taking the boards, but uh, um, adjudicating the board exams, the oral boards. Uh, Dan um, has had a great academic career. He has over 100 publications. He has grants. He has five patents. And I think has even spun off a, a company that primarily, I think, is in veterinary medicine now, but obviously the next step is to help patients. So I'm looking forward to hearing your talk, Dan. Thank you so much for coming. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for the wonderful invitation. Awesome uh, time last night. Really appreciate it. Um, so microbial-based immunotherapy. And the question is, is can we really make friends with an enemy to, to kill cancer? Um, I have a couple disclosures. I'm the chief medical officer of a startup company, Salspera, which is um, a salmonella-based immunotherapy company. And I advise MD Biosciences, which is a biotech in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. So I first want to start and talk about us and, and us as patients and, and our patients. And, we almost take it for granted we have the best job in the world, honestly. We get to take care of people. Um, we get all kinds of accolades, and especially those of us in the pediatric world, um, we can offer sometimes a 90 to 100-year guarantee. Um, this is me on my sleep study, and I just want to point out that if you do a residency, they talk about something called the sleep latency period. That is your time to go to sleep from when your head hits the pillow until you're asleep. Mine was 60 seconds. <laughs> so this is a brief outline. I'm going to talk about my uh, first development of salmonella with the interleukin-2 gene, talk about the clinical work and the preclinical work, and then I'm going to go into what my laboratory is doing now. Um, so let's take a step back, and, and cancer is, is a big problem, and it's quickly becoming one of the, the biggest killers in the world today, and in fact, um, in 2008, there were 7.8 million deaths around the world, and by 2030, it's estimated to be 13 million deaths. And, and in fact, as the world becomes more and more developed and more sophisticated, cancer is going to be the number one cause of death, even in the third world. And um, when I think about cancer, I always think about 
our patients? And is there a possibility to deliver new and exciting, but yet non-toxic options? And I uh, can all recognize a child with a hepatoblastoma. So current cancer therapy, we have chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, and biologics. But as we all know, and we've all witnessed that sometimes our treatments are often as lethal as our primary diseases. So I think that the onus is upon us that we need to develop medication, um, cancer agents that, that will kill a, a tumor, but also not kill the person itself. And so I'm going to tell you a story, which is an absolute labor of love that I started when I was in graduate school. And we were thinking in a, in a lab meeting, we're saying, well, what if we can empower our own immune system to make many more cancer killing cells? And what if we can induce cancer immune memory so that you can't even relapse. So about 25 years ago now, we thought we had the answer. And it was this substance, this interleukin-2, cytokine that is very high, highly effective and very high doses. However, it's extremely toxic. It will kill 5% of the people you give it to in a proper dose. It will kill 5% of the people you give it to. Another 20% will put them in the ICU with a, uh, um, a pulmonary edema syndrome. It's also expensive. So despite 20-plus years of development, systemic cytokine delivery still is very toxic and is limited its use, and including even the biologics we have today. So in our laboratory, we thought, what if we could stealthily deliver IL-2 directly to a cancer and eliminate, eliminate all its bad side effects? So we had this hair-brained idea. I guess we're supposed to call that a hypothesis. Um, can we use salmonella to carry IL-2 to the cancer to empower the immune system? And this was born out of a meeting I went to um, where we heard a microbiologist talk about the ability of salmonella to colonize um, the liver because it peaks out the liver at the safe site with a, with a uh, systemic infection. And can we just put that gene for IL-2 into it and let it release right into the liver, for example, if someone had liver cancer? So I want to say that the salmonella that we're working on is a friend, and it's not a foe. It's been genetically modified, so it cannot cause any disease. And interestingly, it has an extraordinarily high affinity for cancers. So that if, God forbid, if any of us got a salmonella infection and we had a solid tumor, you would find salmonella concentrates in that tumor at a ratio of 1,000 to 10,000 to 1 over any other organ in the body, including the liver. So... But this idea of bacterial-based cancer therapy is not a new idea. This is William Coley. We all know of Coley's talk. And this is at the turn of the last century. He noted a head and neck cancer patient who developed a post-operative strep infection. And subsequently, the recurrence that the patient was having was completely eliminated, which led him to believe that if, if there was something in that infection that induce some sort of immune response that would eliminate these cancers, and he then developed what's called Colby's toxins, which is heat killed strep pyogenes and serratia marcesa. He actually gave this stuff to thousands of patients, but in typical fashion, he got um, into an argument with the head of of the hospital in which he was at, the New York Hospital, which happened to be uh, this famous Dr. Ewing of Ewing sarcoma. And so he sort of had this battle ongoing, and Ewing never adopted or felt that what Coley was doing was beneficial. But there's an interesting paper in, written in 1983 which compared the state of the art at that time in oncology and looked at breast cancer recurrence and patients that Coley was treating with Coley's toxin, and the outcomes were equivalent as far as recurrence rate and cure rate. And patients with breast cancer given conventional chemotherapy in 1983 and those given Coley's toxins from the century before. Oncologists never really viewed his work as serious or, and they never really adopted it. So what did we do? We took an attenuated form of salmonella and the salmonella is an interesting bug because it lacks the ASDG, it stands for aspartite semialdehyde dehydrogenase, which encodes, it's an essential component for encoding the construction of the bacterial cell wall. And we took a plast 
and put the IL-2 gene into it and then gave it to the bacteria, inserted it into the DNA of the bacteria. So that basically we have a suicide mechanism built into the bacteria. So if it ever were to attempt to revert to its wild type strain, it would die. So there's no way this thing can revert to any type of wild strain or become bad. So the first thing we did was we had to characterize, we made this bug, took a while, does it make biologically active IL-2, and can it invade tumors? And the answer is yes, and yes. And this is the standard chromium release assay that shows that if you have control animals, salmonella without the IL-2 gene, and those given the IL-2 gene, and this is an oral administration, you can, you can see biological activity in your IL-2. And similarly, if you give it to an animal orally, that is a mouse, with a different types of tumors. So, for example, it's natural host is liver, but if you look here, you can see it invade tumors very nicely. And let me blow up this part, the lower part of the graph, and you can see it invades different tumors differently. Hepatomas, neuroblastoma, colorectal cancers, and osteosarcomas that just happened the ones we looked at. But interestingly, it also divides more efficiently in tumors than it does in its natural host of the liver. Loves neuroblastoma and osteogenic sarcoma, interestingly. So next we have to figure out where is this stuff going? When you, when you give it to a mouse orally, where is it going? And is it getting into these tumors as we thought it was? And so we green fluorescent protein labeled our salmonella and when you um, look under a polarized microscope, you can get the bacteria to glow. And then when you polarize the microscope, you can get them to glow green. Then if you give it to an animal with a large neuroblastoma, and then you um, polarize the microscope, you can see that both the salmonella IL-2 will target intracellular cancer cells and also hangs out in the interstitial space in this entire tumor. So, Next, hey, what's the in vivo efficacy? And we looked at di different tumor models here. Neuroblastoma, really common tumor in infants. I don't have to remind this crowd about what that tumor is. But as you know, if you have a high stage or high risk disease, the survival is pretty uh, abysmal. And you can do we uh, devise a method by injecting the suprarenal space with some neuro-2A cells, and you can get a big neuroblastoma. And we did these experiments. If with one oral dose, if you inject neuroblastoma cells and then give one oral dose of salmonella and then look at these tumors, we can get an 80% reduction in the size of the tumor after one dose. So these are control animals. Animals fed salmonella without the IL-2 gene and with the IL-2 gene. And similarly, metastatic osteogenic sarcoma, so tail vein injection of, uh, of osteosarcoma cells, floods the lungs with, the, with the hundreds of metastases. And interestingly, large breed dogs have, get osteosarcoma as well, but at 10 times the incidence of humans. So here we are again, tail vein injection of osteogenic sarcoma cells, control animal, Salmonella IL-2 without the gene and then with the gene, an 85% reduction in the amount of tumor colonization um, and burden, if you will, with one dose. Um, and then metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, what we did here was inject the spleen with the colorectal cancer cells and then wait a few minutes, take out the spleen, and you get hundreds of hepatic metastases. Again, control animals, animals fed salmonella without the IL-2 gene, 60% reduction in the numbers of metastases after one oral dose. If we take these survivors, of which when you do that, when you, when you, when you do this model and you, you, you will see about 40% long-term survival. If we take those survivors and re-challenge them with a direct portal vein injection, of, of uh, more colorectal cancer cells, they all live. So we have a, we've established the cancer immune memory. So here's our control animal, and then those given that were given salmonella, just a one-time dose, you can see 100% survive. And this is what you can see. Um, just the, I mean, the grossly is where you have uh, tumors just 
flooded, a uh, liver flooded with tumors, and then you can see a nice glistening uh, liver with one or two metastases actually making, thinking like a surgeon, maybe we've gone from an unrespectable to a respectable tumor. So how is this all working? And to summarize my entire PhD thesis with two slides, um, basically we did depletion studies and looked at CD4 cells, CD8 cells, copper cells, hepatic uh, macrophages. Basically, if you deplete those cell populations, you don't, you still see an anti-tumor response. However, if you deplete natural killer cells, so here are control animals and animals were really depleted of natural killer cells. And these are numbers of hepatic metastases. Here we are giving salmonella IL-2, again, another over 60% reduction in the numbers of metastases. And if you deplete your natural killer cells, you lose that anti-tumor effect, implying that this is purely an NK cell mediated phenomenon. So I did publish 13 studies just based on what you saw, used about 4,000 mice, and there were no side effects, none at all. So at this point, we thought, okay, it's now time to jump and see if we can bring this to the clinic. So we did two simultaneous studies, one in dogs at our vet school at the University of Minnesota and one in humans at the cancer center. So let's talk about our phase one canine clinical study. This is a, um, a typical patient. This is Buddy, a six-year-old golden retriever who lived in, in the suburbs of Minneapolis with his family, had started getting limp and took him to his local veterinarian who noticed a large mass on his, on his right, uh, on his left butt leg here. And, uh, and so he underwent an amputation. And Buddy was then offered to, he was referred to the University of Minnesota Vet School and was offered to enter into a study. And the study was as follows. He would get a dose of salmonella with chemotherapy, an amputation, and then five subsequent rounds of salmonella with doxorubicin every three weeks for a total of six cycles. So I'll say that again. So salmonella chemotherapy amputation and then five additional rounds of salmonella IL-2 with chemotherapy, doxorubicin, every three weeks for five cycles. And what we found uh, was, this is the paper, that we had 19 dogs enter the study. Six were terminated early due to progression and the families chose to euthanize the animal. Um, three of the six, three were terminated after four doses, two after two doses, and one after one dose. However, we found in the remaining uh, 13 dogs, there were five long-term survivors. Buddy lived, that dog I showed you, lived for an additional five years and then had a, a recurrence of another type of tumor, and the family put him down uh, almost 11 years old. But what we found was that at 350 days, so approximately a year, that we had a 40% disease-free for survival compared to 20% with standard of care, which is usually low-dose toxins. And the reason they use low-dose chemotherapy in dogs and people's pets is they don't want the unpleasant side effects all over your living carpet, is the bottom line. And we also found that we had at 500 days a 22% overall survival compared to no survivors with standard of care. So we're pretty excited when we see these results. Not perfect, but at least some hint of efficacy. Now, in our phase one human trial, what we did was it was a dose escalation curve of going from 10 to the fourth bacteria to 10 to the ninth bacteria, one-time dose just looking for toxic. And this was a trip to try to get it to the FDA because this was basically the first time getting someone oral salmonella. Um, and I still remember sitting around the, um, the NIH Committee on Recombinant DNA trying to convince them to give us um, approval so that the FDA would do the study. And the question was, how are you going to give this salmonella, Dr. Saltzman? And I said, well, basically you take a little Maalox and and then you chase it down with the salmonella, which you thaw out. It comes frozen with a little Gatorade and chases the little Gatorade. I got a blank stare. And I said, we don't understand this. I said, what, what does it mean you don't understand? So what's the exact progression? I said, well, you take the Maalox, then you down the salmonella, chase a little Gatorade. 
which is why I really don't understand. And I had been sitting in this meeting for about six and a half hours, and I was getting a little punchy. And I said, have you ever been on spring break where you lick the salt, you bite the lime, and down the tequila? It's the same progression. We got it. So basically, there was no survival advantage with one dose of salmonella. However, we saw a statistically elevate elevation in your natural killer NKT cell population after five weeks of trying to see the split. So you can see uh, here is the NK cell, uh, uh, an elevation in the population, almost doubling the amount of NK cells they have. So we were also curious at the time that could this be an adjunct to the standard of care? So if you look at, and the dog study, we gave it to doxorubicin. And the protocols all call, called because we didn't want to deviate too much from the standard of care by just adding this salmonella to it. And if you look at um, animal weight, so I guess that's the best way we have, and this is mice data, um, urine data, showing that if you just give high dose, maximum tolerated dose doxorubicin to a mouse, they lose about 25% of their body weight. And anything over 5% is considered pretty toxic. And however, if you cut down the amount of doxorubicin by 75%, you give a quarter amount of the dose, and combine it with salmonella, you don't see any appreciable toxicity. However, let me just go to this slide, you see a, um, a similar biologic or, or uh, oncologic outcome. So here's PBS controls in, in mice with... Uh, with uh, um, osteogenic sarcoma, and if you give them a single dose of salmonella IL-2, that's here. However, if you combine salmonella with um, a quarter of the amount of doxorubicin, we get equivalent amount. So pretty cool. Why is this working? And the interesting thing is we found that tumors are in all phases of their cell cycle, but those that are in the G0 phase or the dormant phase are chemo-resistant. And salmonella actually pushes those tumor cells to actively and dividing phases, making them more susceptible to chemotherapy. Interestingly, also, chemotherapy enhances salmonella IL-2 because the, the chemotherapy creates these vascular disruptions and necrotic spaces within the tumor microenvironment, enhancing, making these warm, soupy areas for the bacteria to colonize. So at this point, um, the University of Minnesota passed on the patent for this drug. The guy that made that decision no longer works at the University of Minnesota. I lived in North Dakota somewhere I understand. And, um, and I've out-licensed this to a, a veterinary pharmaceutical company, and it is now going through the regulatory phases and will go into production for dogs with uh, osteosarcoma in the next quarter. Um, we're also looking for a human partner, and uh, that's another story. But my question was, is can we do better? You know, in our dog trial, we had 10 to 16 of the dogs never survived. Why not? And in the human trial, one oral dose, we never saw a survival advantage. We saw a couple of NK cells go up, but really, honestly, why, why is that? And this is what I have been uh, doing for the last five years, is to try to figure this out and maybe create our next generation of salmonella-based cancer therapy. So I think we all know that this is, um, this is a pretty hot topic right now, these immune uh, privileged tumors um, and result in variable colonization of tumors. So basically we have, uh, and that's the whole idea of immune checkpoint inhibitors come with here. But I've always felt in my gut and in my heart that we have the ideal cancer therapy. So we have this self-propelled organism this tumor target senses the environment and pumps out these cancer-killing immune cells. And this is adapted from my friend Neil Forbes, who is uh, also in this, uh, in this space using salmonella for cancer. But <laughs> I spelled that wrong on purpose. But uh, skeptics are everywhere. I have written probably 12 NIH grants. I have, I've gotten one R21 funded, but honestly, it has been really hard to get funding because everyone, every grant reviewer will cite this paper. This was a phase one study done here, right down the street, 
um, where they gave IV salmonella to people with melanoma. And it made them really sick. You can't, it's hard to give a gram negative bacteria in, intravenously and not make them sick. Um, and it doesn't work. And everyone cites this paper with every grant I've ever read. And, I, and it's so hard to get beyond that. On top of that now, there's about three or four companies in the U.S. now are looking at bacterial-based cancer therapy. There's one using listeria, clostridium spores. And the big uh, news a couple months ago was that uh, Amgen um, had a deal with Advaxis, which makes a cancer-killing listeria. And when they had some high-profile death in the clinical phase two trial, Amgen uh, terminated their $540 million deal. So, and they're looking at, again, delivering intravenously these pretty toxic gram-negative bacteria. It's one thing to give it oral. It's another to give it intravenously. So, in order to get my idea up and working was I thought we can further attenuate the salmonella because I Ideally, would be is if you can deliver them intravenously, you can get even more robust tumor colonization. But I needed money. So a few years ago, I wrote I don't know, 10 grants. None of them got funded. And um, I thought, I was talking to a good friend of mine who owned the largest closed caption company in the United States, Caption Bank. And I said, oh, we should do a fundraiser or something like that. He said, no, no, no. You're thinking about this all wrong. We need to think about crowdsource funding for cancer research. I've heard of crowdsource funding for other things, like a startup of a new gadget or something like that. He goes, no, it's this is the way. So the next thing you know, I found myself in a boardroom of an advertising agency downtown Minneapolis. And if you've ever been to a boardroom of an advertising agency, it's nothing like any other boardroom you've ever been in. They're really out there and a lot of fun. I had to stick my neck, my neck out a little bit here, but I did get permission from the dean of the medical school and my department chair, and we launched Project Stealth, Video Appeal, Facebook, and Twitter. And the funny part is I had no idea how to do any of that, and my daughters did the Facebook and the Twitter thing. Um, and uh, so we launched in 2013 Project Stealth. ProjectStealth.org. And within a few minutes, I got a call from one of the assistant deans of research. This is very unconventional. We don't do this here. We write grants. I said, have you not noticed that there's a world recession and that nobody's funding any grants only, and the NIH has dropped their funding level? He goes, it's just not the way we do things here. You're not going to raise $6, much less whatever you want to raise. I said, I want to raise $500,000. Good luck. I learned I had to develop a pretty thick skin in addition to sticking my neck out because it was interesting the amount of um, negative feedback I got uh, from my uh, cancer research colleagues that this was very unconventional and not the way to do it. Um, in fact, I'll just tell you a quick story. The day I got called by this assistant dean, is it, it was a snowy day and a car had spun out with five kids in it and went into a holding pond at an exit ramp. And all five kids went underneath the water, under the water. And they came out and we were putting them on ECMO when my cell phone rang. Um, and I couldn't talk at the moment. I said, I'm a little busy. He goes, we need to talk about this. This is really not appropriate. Oh, no. So here we go. So my $6 prediction, within 22 months, I set up distinct scientific goals to raise $485,000 off of Twitter and Facebook. And, um, and to date, I've raised $2.2 million um, doing that. So, and I've acquired a lot of preliminary data, which I'm going to show you now, that there is a federal grant. Uh, and it turned into this in the paper, which I hated. But um, anyway. So, like I talk about, the holy grail of bacterial-based cancer therapy is, number one, you want robust tumor colonization. And the question is, can you give a bacteria intravenously versus one? We should continue to do no harm. And can we deliver immune modulating proteins directly into the tumor microbiome? So I went back to the drawing board. Got to start in the beginning. 
So this is what we thought. Okay, so you have salmonella, T is a cancer. Elaborate from IL-2 and IL-15. The uh, cancer then elaborates these um, um, immune suppression blockers. We block that with some PDL1 and anti-CTLA4, block that up, and then stop the cancer. So let's see if we can do it. Back to the, back to the draw work, took my same plasmid, and instead of putting in the IL-2, I put on a bunch of different um, immune modulating proteins. If you want to see a mouse get really sick, give them salmonella with CNF, by the way. That'll make them really sick. But nonetheless, we had a bunch of these. And they actually, this list is short. There's a, at least another um, two or three rows left. And we figured out that we were going to give them this. Two immune stimulating proteins, IL-2 and IL-15, with its receptor on it. And then um, we used the short chain fragment of the FB portion of the, uh, of the antibody, anti tdl one and anti ctl 4 That was a two-year project just to make that. And we put it all together, and the first time, I'm just going to cut to the chase, if you give um, control animals, these are numbers of, uh, of um, pulmonary metastases from osteogenic sarcoma in a mouse model, and by just giving three of them together, IL-2, IL-15, and anti tdl one we can find. Pretty cool. Before, I was only seeing about an 80% reduction. Now we're at almost all of it gone. Then we got to thinking, thinking here, wait a minute, this seems a little too easy. And I'm looking at, um, and at, uh, at clinical trials, and I see this huge amount of clinical trials for cancer. They're all saying, why is that? So I said, I'm going to stack the deck against me, and I'm going to use a different model. And I, we went to the, what's called the Balbin T model, which is a mouse that be, has that carries the breast cancer gene. And if they're positive for the homozygous for the breast cancer gene, it takes 16 weeks, and they'll start making breast cancers. By the time you fill the breast cancer, it's analogous to having a human have a 150 millimeter cube tumor, which is about this big, based on weight. So it's big. It's a big cancer. And if you and to make a long story short, if this is control animal, so at 16 weeks you can start feeling the tumor, and by 30 days they're all dead. However, we can double their survival um, by giving them uh, a salmonella with, again, IL-2, IL-15, PDL-1, and PTLA-4. However, the question is, is this is there something else that we can do here? Something's not right. And again, this is what you see. Um, we can really arrest the, the amount of, uh, of growth of that cancer, but it starts to grow after 60 days. We can double the survival. So we were successful in delivering immune modulating protein, but can we get better tumor colonization to even impart, impact a further anti tumor effect? So the question then came up is should we do IV or oral therapy again? And it came back to this way that we're studying cancer. Again, of all drugs that go into a phase one trial for cancer, there's a 92% fail rate, 92%. 86% don't even make it past phase one. So the question is, should we use these um, transplant models where you inject cancer cells underneath the skin of a mouse and watch the tumor grow in a week or two, give them your therapy and your whole thing's done in 14 days, or do you use these autoxinous models, these natural occurring models where they have different genes that cause tumors to grow? And that's what we decided to do. And the reason was this. So if I look at a transplant model, that's this 4T1 breast cancer, and I'd like you to look just at the black bars. This is colonization of the tumor after giving salmonella. And you can see a pretty robust amount of salmonella growth in cancer. However, if you have a, a toxinous tumor, that is a naturally growing tumor in a mouse, they don't even colonize half of them. And what we ended up doing is giving them a vascular disrupting agent, and we can get it closer, but it's not the same as the transplant model. And the reason is, is that we, we don't, these, these slower-growing tumors don't have these necrotic spaces within them that allows bacteria to colonize, and that's what we have here, where you can see 
really robust vascular necrotic phase compared to controls. However, if you load the GFP, um, if you load the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a fluorescent gene into them, you can get these mice to glow. And these are how many cancers, uh, solid cancers they have on uh, uh, using this breast cancer model. You can see they have a lot of mammary glands here. And with intravenous salmonella, we can really light them up and they grow. However, intravenous salmonella is pretty toxic. And in fact, I had to give an IL-6 inhibitor to stop the typical gram-negative sepsis that you would see. So the question is, is that can we make a salmonella that you don't need to give an IL-6 inhibitor to that you can give intravenously and get robust tumor colonization and do no harm, no toxicity? And the answer is by going back to the drawing board again. So microbe-specific molecules that are recognized by given pattern recognition receptors, PRRs, result in these patho pathogen-associated molecular patterns that include LPS, nucleic acid, and bacterial peptides that induce this gram-negative sepsis that you can see. So we started playing with the gene. And you'll see that a lot of these are X'd out here only because it's proprietary information. I'll share with that at the end of why that is. But we started looking at what are TLR4 agonists, TLR5 agonists, 2 agonists, and then started making some treatments. We delete certain genes, and it gets really complicated. And each one of these, there's a lot of gene jockeying going on here to create different species of salmonella that would eliminate its toxic effect if you inject it intravenously, but still maintain its infectivity of the tumor microenvironment. So we settled in. First thing to do is look at weight. Remember, we talked about toxicities, looking at um, um, weight loss after giving a, uh, a bacteria. Now, I'm giving 2 million bacteria intravenously, 2 million bacteria, and we're seeing about a 5% weight loss. I will tell you that in the bacteria that was used in that paper I cited that sacks every grant, the, uh, that species is called BNP 20,009. As soon as you inject it, every mouse dies immediately. Immediately. It's, it's, it's not subtle. They all die. Here we're seeing long-term survivors with no weight loss. And we're seeing, this is very early data. This is actually only two weeks old. We're seeing um, lighting up nicely in these tumors. And then lastly, efficacy of, and we literally have made probably a hundred different constructs that we're going through now to figure out which one is the most effective. And again, control animal, animals without immunostimulation in animals with immunostimulation, seeing a remarkable effect. So in summary, our bacterial-based cancer therapy, um, my main focus now is second generation, non-toxic, tumor colonizing, secretion of immune-modulating protein, and look, appears to be synergistic with chemotherapy, allowing lower doses of chemotherapy to be used. And so ongoing now is we're sort of narrowing things down to try to figure out which exact species to give, and then doing our pre-regulatory talk studies so we can move it into the clinic. My original drug, Salmonella IL-2, uh, has been licensed out, like I said. We have multiple grants patented. Um, the veterinary application has been out licensed. Um, like I said, I think it'll go into um, uh, production here in the second quarter of 2019. And then in the human applications, we are applying for a phase two trial, raising money, doing all the typical things you have to do to get a drug out there, looking for partners. Um, so, um, First generation, Saltipa, now uh, Salmonella IL-2, and then a paradigm shift with our second generation of drugs, which is intravenous and non-toxic, to use it as a drug synthesis platform to tumor microenvironment. Um, and I think we can represent a, maybe a paradigm shift in cancer therapy 
with a combination of salmonella with chemotherapy and using lower dose. This is the best Christmas card I've ever got from one of my wellness tumors patients. Can't beat that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, a wonderful talk on cancer. I don't have to talk about it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when you have one, I'm to those people, um, you know, whether that's a token of appreciation or something like that. When you're funding research such as this, was there anything that you gave back to those crowdfunders per se? So that's a great question. So what we did, um, it, these advertising people were really amazing. I can't take any credit for so um, the first thing we did is we had to get the word out. And to get the word out, you had to get a public relations firm who had some contact with the local newspapers. To send it. And the way they got these reporters to even open the package, because you imagine these reporters are always opening up envelopes with different news stories and tips in it, is you sent them a plush toy of, of a salmonella. <laughs> we ordered on Amazon. Got a little plush toy with all these flagella and these strings on it. So it's sort of like, what the hell is this? And so now that's the place you do that. Um, I wrote um, updates to all of the donors. I, I wrote them actually each a personal letter. To every donor, um, they got a personal thank you note letter from me from every, um, every donation. And then I sent periodic updates about every six weeks on actually showing them actual data from the lab about what exactly where we were, what our stated goals were, and this is the end result. So it was, it was a lot of work. Tough to balance that scientific integrity, holding the IP, yes. and then also being uh, messaging. Right. And, in fact, um, interestingly, in that newspaper article, I, I became um, – um, I had a lot of conversations with, the, with, uh, with one of the reporters who then called uh, a gentleman named Art Kaplan. Art Kaplan's a medical bioethicist at the University of Pennsylvania. He used to be at the University of Minnesota. And, um, and it's exactly that. It's, in, it's balancing that integrity – scientific integrity, you know, are you on the business side or are you on the research side? And the way that, um, that I decided to do is share the data, good or bad, it's getting out there. And so that's what I did. Yes, sir. Really extraordinary um, uh, body of work and the, the history through time is uh, really uh, very exciting uh, to follow and a real testimony to your persistence. Conceptually, at the end of the day, what I think you're doing is delivering a, a um, uh, cytokines locally and trying Correct. to enhance and at the same time control the local immune response in a way that is detrimental to the tumor. Right. right. And you're using a bacterial to do that. Right. Smart bomb. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's sort of interesting. Are there other smart bombs besides bacteria that could be... Uh, employed to sort of deliver mm -hmm. uh, the, the same thing? Is there a viral model, a life there is. model, different models mm -hmm. that are sort of uh, competing in this space? There the are. In fact, the are. NCI did a nice conference last summer. Um, at the first time people have been working in this space have gotten us all together last summer at the NCI. And um, there was an, adeno carcin an adenovirus model uh, and an oncolytic virus model that um, – same sort of thing. Harder to, um, bacteria are easy to work with. Viruses, not so much, but the people that do it are, are quite accomplished and, and they have similar results. The one guy that I know really well, Masato Yamamoto, again at the University of Minnesota, is working at um, pancreas cancer. A really tough cancer to penetrate. It's so dense fibrotically, there's not a lot of good vascular ingrowth, hard to deliver. Um, uh, any type of immune modulating protein too. And he's gotten some good, some interesting results. But yeah, the answer is yes. There's also people using this listeria, um, clostridium spores, or sort of another, um, another space. Yes, sir. It's a great question. So um, I was talking to um, um, a person working in, in the bariatric space who found that if you alter the 
bi- the, um, the microbiome in, in rats and rabbits that have um, intestinal bypass surgery or even sleeve resection. If you alter the microbiome, you can predict how much weight they're going to lose or not lose based on that. And one of the accepted ways of wiping out and controlling the microbiome is oral vancomycin. And so I have done that, where I've given oral, oral vancomycin and then challenged with oral salmonella, and you do get extremely robust, tumor, more tumor colonization than you would if you were not messing with the microbiome. And creating that, those mucous membranes are, and tight junctions are very leaky. And uh, animals get pretty sick, though, when they lose their microbiome. It's... Uh, it's not a walk in the park. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Jeff Dome. I'm the chief of oncology here. Um, what is? Oh. A, a, <laughs> thanks for that fascinating talk. Yeah. Um, what's the cause of the, the tropism of the bacteria to the tumors? Is it a blood flow effect, or are there other factors that that lead to the so attraction? Only theory, but Salmonella is a facultative intracellular parasite that likes low hypoxic conditions. So the idea is that it, 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 if you were to get a salmonella infection by eating bad eggs or bad ice cream or something, and you um, do a liver biopsy, you'd find a bunch of them there. Um, but tumors are even more hypoxic than the liver. They have all these necrotic spaces, and they think that that's the tropism, the tropism for, for this. Um, but not really been proven, and I can show that it's there, but I don't know how it gets there. Interesting part. Diego. Hey, Dan, thanks. Great, great talk. I really enjoyed it. I mean, uh, really fascinating. How do you control for variation? And I, I imagine there's, there's a variability that depends a bit on the immune function, on bactericidal or, or phagocytotic effect of the host on your bacterial vector in terms of how it, how it would behave in the tumor. So we're doing that by changing the promoter in, that we use in the uh, plasma that delivers the immune modulating protein. So we can use a promoter that only goes up and gets turned on um, in hypoxic condition. We're using another promoter that, you know, tumors run a little hot, and so it, it only gets turned on. So it won't get turned. You don't see any release of cytokines systemically because um, it's at 37 degrees. I may be 37 degrees systemically, but in the tumor, you're at 30.5 or something like that. But that is a big problem. And um, one of the ways we can get around it is by repeated dose and of uh, getting the, the host to phagocytize these stuff. But what happens is when they do that, they lyse the bacteria and then locally release these cytokines that were being held inside the vacuole inside the bacteria as well. So we get a and personally, I think that it's a vice. It's, we're also seeing the systemic effect of the immune, immune systemic effect in addition to a local system, uh, immune effect. Sorry. Have you seen uh, any sort of uh, evidence of SIRS uh, if you give a large enough dose? Yeah, and that, that was the whole idea when by, by knocking out specific genes, toll like receptor 4, 5, to all of them, if we can target certain flagellin genes, certain LPS genes, we can start dialing down uh, the amount of systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And um, like I said, it, it, the, the bacteria that went in in that clinical trial, um, at the dose, we were able to get 2 million, 2 million bacteria intravenously and see no side effects or very nothing, 4 or 5% weight loss. But the fact that the mice were great is quite remarkable. When we gave it to our mice, within minutes, they were all dead of this SIRS. Which could be a double-edged sword. It is. Anyway, one thing I learned today, Dan, thank you very much for this great talk, but one thing I learned is that even if you're not getting funding and you're passionate about something, you'll find a way to do it. And that was a real take on (laughs) it. So, really, thank you very much for your information.